Um, good evening, everyone. We're Team UMD Route, and we're trying to combat drowsy driving. Um, so drowsy driving is probably um, more common than you think it would be. About 60% of Americans that reported um, that they had driven drowsy, 37% um, of those reported uh, that they actually fell asleep behind the wheel. Okay, so how many of you have ever um, pulled an all-nighter? Okay, so that's a solid, that's a solid like 60 percent of you. Okay, so we know that um, getting 24 hours of sleep for um, one day, or getting an average of four to five hours, is the equivalent of blood alcohol content of 0.1 percent. Um, does anyone know the legal limit for DUI in Maryland? 0.08. So, <laughs> so this is I guess this is pretty serious impairment. Um, more than 100,000 crashes a year are attributed um, to drowsy driving being the primary cause. Okay, so our research questions are aimed, um, they're aimed at creating a device that will help alert the driver when they become too drowsy. So the first step in doing this is to be able to detect drowsiness. So that's what we're focusing on. So we want to um, detect drowsiness as cheaply as possible using some sort of portable device and create a trade-off between um, how accurate the readings are. So for our methodology, right now we're looking at two major devices. Um, uh, this one right here is a Brainwave EEG headset. So it's just a single electrode that goes like sort of in the middle of your forehead and it measures the changes in voltage. So this electrode is particularly sensitive to eye blinks because, it's, because of its location. Um, and also, um, your brain has different, uh, emits different frequencies um, based on whether or not you're, whether you're alert, drowsy, whether you're in deep sleep or not. Um, so this is what we're using the EEG device for. Um, for the eye tracking camera, um, we, are, we can also detect eye blinks using this. This is just a little uh, small like um, dismount, dismantled webcam that gets mounted into your eye. And it can also track your eye movements, um, which can also be used to determine drowsiness. Um, just as a basic exposition of the neuroscience of EEG, so, so when a neuron fires, it, act, it changes the electrical, electrical potential in the area. And when it fires, it also tends to activate all the surrounding neurons, and it goes en masse like a wave from one part of the brain to another. Um, so when this happens, we're able to detect it. And uh, as you can see, you have delta waves, theta waves, alpha waves, beta waves, and actually many other such spectrums. Uh, delta waves are when a person is in deep sleep. Um, uh, when, when that happens, the delta wave has a higher power, um, meaning it makes up more of the oscillations in the brain. Uh, but we're not actually very concerned with that because if someone's in deep sleep, they're probably they've already crashed. Or, uh, so, so we're we're really concerned with alpha waves and beta waves and the power, with, uh, the respective powers that they occupy. So, alpha wave is when a person is awake but relaxed. Uh, usually, the power of the alpha wave goes up when the person is, you know, in, in bed trying to go to sleep, uh, their eyes closed, this kind of thing. Um, and beta waves have a higher power when the person is alert, you know, maybe taking an exam or this kind of thing. Uh, so, another thing that we can do with the EEG and uh, something that's really useful in detecting drowsiness is blinks. So, on the screen, you see. Uh, this is just me blinking 10 times, uh, and you can just see like a really good pattern. Not everyone can blink as well as I do. Um, <laughs> I mean, we like purposely we did not put up Boris uh, blink patterns, but but it's still it's still it's still really good. Um, it's really easy to knock this out. We're able to detect a number of blinks uh, despite despite the person. Um, and so when a person, yeah, just so, so when a person blinks more, they're more likely to be drowsy. Um, but the main part of the EG is the, the, uh, the different distributions of, of the different powers. So right here, like, so we have, we have all the different, 
power bands like alpha, beta, but I'm, I'm just going to show you an alpha. Uh, right here, what we have is we plotted the number of times each uh, alpha power frequency occurred. So uh, here again, this is me, but we gathered the data with several people on the team. Uh, we had them, you know, once when they were resting, gather the data. Uh, late at night, about to go to bed, gather the drowsiness data, and then when they were alert, uh, maybe uh, playing a, uh, like a brain game, this kind of thing, uh, we, we gather data for alert from, from that. Uh, so here's just the drowsiness data. And you'll, see, and you'll see some good trends. Um, so here's the alertness data. As you can see, uh, for alpha, it's uh, more concentrated towards the lower end because alpha frequency should be have less power um, uh, when the person is alert. And then we, we made a model, uh, an exponential curve, that, and we fitted that. So we fitted, here's the green that goes over the black, black distribution, and the blue that goes over the red distribution. Uh, we actually got really, it was statistically significant and very useful. Uh, this is just the same curve as in the so, um, yeah, so I, I talked about all these things, but one of the challenges we're still having with this is it takes a long time to get the base data um, for each individual. So we do have different curves for every individual. They don't you know, match up exactly. And so if, if someone was going to use it, they would need 15 minutes uh, to, for us to even calibrate the device for them. And they would have to be alert and drowsy and so on. Uh, so we're looking into in the future maybe splicing the data in a different way. We were able to, at, at first we weren't able to, it just all looked like noise and uh, trying different algorithms we found something that worked. So maybe if we're able to find another algorithm that um, cuts down on the time required, that would be, uh, that would uh, basically get us to our end point. So for the camera, what we're, uh, the method that we're using for the camera is based on a principle called vestibular ocular reflex. And this is essentially the eye's way to balance itself when you're moving your head. Um, so when you're turning left or right, you would notice that your eyes are still somewhat focused on the area that you were originally looking at. Um, however, when you're drowsy, this reaction speed slows down uh, significantly. And this is what we're trying to measure with our camera. So originally we used an algorithm called WearScript. Um, what we aimed on doing with WearScript was finding the location of the pupil on the eye. And however, we realized that WearScript was extremely slow. It processed about one frame per second, which is nowhere near enough to be able to find the movement of the eye or the velocity. Um, so we decided to switch to a different program called Pupil. Um, using pupil, we're able to uh, accurately detect where the pupil is on the eye, and this algorithm is actually significantly faster, and uh, it moves, the algorithm processes at about the same rate as your camera can process. So our camera can only process 24 frames per second, which is more than enough for uh, the VOR effect. <coughs> so pupil also processes it as 24 frames per second. Um, this allows for us to be able to detect when the eye moves and the velocity in which the eye moves when you're looking around. Um, as you can see in the image, a red circle indicates where your uh, the radius of your pupil, and the red dot indicates the center of the pupil. And using this, uh, this is later on uh, sent through a data feed in order to uh, determine your eye's movements. Yeah, moving forward from here, um, we have to improve our data analysis programs right now. They're um, not as good as we want them to be. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to try to reduce the amount of false positives we get from the data and completely eliminate the number of false negatives. If someone's drowsy, we want the program to tell them that they're drowsy. Um, after we're done with that, we're going to determine the best drowsiness device, either the EEG or the camera, and then use that as our final device. Okay, a few other things we might um, follow up on after we're done looking at the 
the camera and the EEG. Um, there's a few algorithms that we found while we were researching that we didn't actually have the time to look up, um, look into. But if we have, have the time, we'll uh, try to see how good they are. For instance, uh, the Perclose algorithm, uh, it measures the amount of time your eyes are closed while you're blinking. There, people found that the longer your eyes are closed and you're blinking, the more drowsy you are. So we're going to look into that. A few other devices were, um, too, the Emotive EEG headset has more electrodes than the headset that we're using right now. So it, it's a little more reliable, too. And it'll get us voltage differences across different areas. <coughs> and different areas of the brain are shown to have uh, correlate to how drowsy you are, or like the differences. So as with any other group project, we faced um, quite a few difficulties. Um, the first of which was team membership. As you can see, our team is quite small. Um, in the beginning, we kept losing team members. And since we didn't have a solidified topic, uh, it was hard for us to reach consensus on what direction we wanted to take our project. Um, and our current project direction has changed quite a lot and many times from what was originally proposed. Um, and because of that, we've had to start over on our research a few times, and that set us back a little bit. Um, but with our current project, we have also faced some technical difficulties with both software and hardware, um, with both our EEG headset as well as our camera. And as for some advice to the younger members, um, you've heard this many times, but yeah, your project will change. Um, it might change a lot, it might just change a little bit, but um, it's important to um, be flexible and work with it. Um, also, communication with your teammates is key. It's essential to stay on the same page as your teammates in order to continue to make progress. Um, not, not only in terms of organizing yourselves, but also in scheduling. We learned the hard way that if your teammates are, um, if you have teammates that are unable to wake up consistently for 8 a.m. meeting times, do not schedule 8 a.m. meeting times. <laughs> Also, it's important to set goals for yourselves to um, ensure that you're continuing to make significant progress in a timely manner. And most importantly of all, um, you want to like your project idea. If your team does not like your project idea, you guys will be miserable. So you want to change it to the direction that you all agree on. Um, you're going to be putting in a lot of time and effort into your project, and you want to be sure that you're getting something meaningful and something enjoyable out of this. And as our adventure has told us many times, you do not want your gemstone experience to be something that you just, like a box that you just check off on the list. You want to get something good out of it. And with that, we'd also like to extend thanks to our mentor who has helped us through all the rough bumps in the road that we've been through and for providing us with all the resources that we've needed to continue moving forward as a team. Now I'd like to open up the floor to any questions. signal analysis and sensor input output that we weren't really familiar with before we went into this. So that's taking up pretty much all of our time right now. After we're done, um, after we know that those two things work for data analysis and we are good at using them, we're going to go back into finding out how to alert the person. Something, uh, we, earlier we were thinking though of hooking up maybe up to a cell phone or cinnamon scented just see what it's called again. It was a while ago. But, yeah. <laughs> Look it up to a, like, ring on a cell phone, something like that. Yeah. Just, uh, just to add on to that, uh, we're actually, um, so, so we want to get the camera to work and the, the EG device to work, and then we want to create a mod for Google Glass. Um, that's what we're looking at right now, but um, uh, we're, not, we're not sure exactly. We're not thinking about that yet. Uh, yes. Um, are you planning on testing this model on people outside your team, and if so, what will that process be? Okay, so the question was, are you planning on testing the model on people uh, outside of the team? Yeah. Um, 
so um, for now we've been sticking to people on our team because of potential complications that might raise with IRB approval. Um, I know, I don't know um, if people have talked to you guys about this, but IRB approval is a very long process. I know one of the teams said that they like just um, just got IRB approval, so I guess that's what's holding us back from doing that right now. But uh, definitely something to look for. Have you ever considered writing a group of concepts with that that you're claiming that it seems to have to do with the of what you present for the whole competition? Okay, so the question is whether or not we've tried to run tests equating the drowsiness level of 24 hours and four or five, um, 24 hours without sleep, um, that statistic, with actual driving, or uh, with actual um, drunk levels. Uh, and the answer is no. Um, we just took that from the literature that exists out, out right now. Um, also, there might be some safety concerns with doing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess we're trying to focus our attention right now on the detection. Yeah. Um, have you considered breaking down the device into, say, a dashboard camera for eye movement, and then the uh, user can just wear an additional device instead of having it right next to their eyes as they're driving? Um, so the question is whether or not we would um, consider breaking out the parts of the camera so that the user wouldn't have to wear um, the camera right next to them. Maybe it could go on the car dashboard. Um, so the answer to that, um, having multiple parts might cause complications or might cause expenses to go up. There are existing like car in-car systems right now that actually try to do that, but um, you have to like buy a special car made for that purpose. So I guess we're trying to, since it's like a consumer device, you don't want to make the person like put something here, put something here, and that, that just like increases probability that they'll screw up. So, <laughs> um, so I guess we're trying to keep it portable and like relatively small. Yep. Right. So the question is whether or not the camera will interfere with our vision and just driving ability. So I think, um, yeah, so for right now, we have issues with placing the camera like not directly in front of your eye because otherwise it won't be able to see your pupil. Um, I'm not sure. Um, for the future, I think um, if we were to use something like Google Glass, we would be able to keep it like relatively out of the way and also um, be able to shrink the size of the camera um, so that it's not that big a deal. Like if you think of how much um, Google Glass like gets, the, gets in your line of vision, it's not that bad. So I guess that's what we're looking for. Yeah. So the question is, who would be the end user um, who, would, who would use it, I guess? Um, okay, so, um, the, okay, so one possible thought we threw, threw around was having it apply to truck drivers because they have to drive long distances. So trucking companies often have issues with like um, drowsiness, driving walls. Um, another thing that's good to keep in mind that we could integrate it with some sort of consumer product, which is why we keep bringing up Google Glass, because people already have that on anyways, it'll be useful to them, and this is just another way that all of them stay safe. Uh, one more question. Uh, yes. Um, have you thought about incorporating a recording device um, to be used as evidence in accidents? Um, so the question is whether or not we've thought about incorporating a recording device um, to be used as evidence in an accident. Um, so do you mean like recording what's happening outside of your vehicle? Well, just like recording the data that you're collecting to see if the driver was actually drowning in the accident on the vehicle. So if the truck driver makes the company fall uh, because they're the update. Um, yeah, so that's definitely an option to be able to record the data and like prove that you maybe you weren't drowsy in this accident and um, that you were fully alert. Um, um, that's definitely a possibility. It's a possibility. I know that's been done with like um, cell phone devices that track your speed, and then people bring that to court and be like, "Hey, I wasn't speeding, but I got pulled over." So.
Just uh, to add on to that, it has to record anyway, as it is. Um, so right now, yeah, I mean, you could, you know, just increase the memory how long it, it's recording. Um, but you know, just I know it's not the scope of our project, but uh, people could be tampering with it and just be like, you know, even when they're drowsy, uh, find a way to hack the system and never get in trouble. Oh, yeah, like, <laughs> Thank you.